Okay, my name is Linda Gail Arago, born 1949, uh, better known in Taiwan as Ai Ling Da. And uh, this is my little ward here, and her name is Valentine, and she was born on Valentine's Day this year, 2004. Um, okay, well, mostly right now I wanted to give an overview of what uh, Mr. Li Rongzong, uh, the former political prisoner, said today in his interview, which was quite long, so I'd like a, uh, to give an overview. And I've interviewed him several times before. He's quite an articulate participant in uh, the 228 struggle at the Jai Airport. And he was also a political prisoner uh, himself for 15 years, from 1953 to 1968. So, in the first tape, the first half hour, he started out right away talking about the, uh, the KMT and the struggle at the Jai airport. And um, uh, there were, I don't remember all of what he said, but just in general, uh, one of the reasons that there was a conflict at the Jai airport is that the KMT military had been uh, taking pot shots at the uh, farmers, and I believe he had, they'd killed uh, half a dozen people already, shot half a dozen people just right around uh, the area of the airport, you know, people just farming their fields or um, uh, tending their trees. And um, actually, Li Rongzong has talked in the past about them tying farmers up to mango trees and stabbing them with bayonets but I don't know if he talked about that today. Uh, but there were, uh, the situation was that about a thousand KMT soldiers were holed up at the uh, airport uh, after uh, 228 broke out. And this was just like the second or third day after the incidents in Taipei that the whole island knew about, you might say, an uprising against KMT rule. And uh, the uh, KMT military was surrounded at the airport, and um, although the, uh, you could say, insurgents only had about 20 old rifles, uh, they wanted to force the uh, KMT to surrender. Uh, the KMT, however, had big guns, so they could pretty much um, uh, shoot back and uh, kill a lot of people who were trying to take the airport. Um, but there, there was a complication, as, uh, as uh, Li Rongzong said today on the tape, uh, that uh, one of the local administrators, whose last name was uh, Xu, I think it's Xu uh, Kou in Taiwanese, uh, he, had, he was Taiwanese, but he had been with the KMT on the mainland. And uh, when the uh, airport issue, uh, he was with the, I think, the Three People's Principles Promulgation Committee, something like that. So he was trying to tread a middle position between the KMT and uh, the uh, Taiwanese. And he was providing, so he ordered that the uh, KMT troops be provided with uh, uh, something like a thousand pounds of rice a day, enough rice for them to eat, plus a pig for them to slaughter because they demanded to be fed uh, even though they were in a state of war uh, with the uh, local Taiwanese. So you might say they could have been forced to surrender if they had not been fed, um, but as it was they had a, a standoff for, uh, I think it was over a week uh, before uh, finally the uh, big troops came in and uh, massacred the Taiwanese from north to south of Taiwan. And is, of course, when that happened, all the people who were fighting at the airport to try to take the airport uh, scattered. And uh, Li Rongzong also uh, escaped. Uh, he came back the next day to a nearby port, uh, Bu Dai. Uh, as I remember, as he told me, Bu Dai is the port near Jai. It's a little bit north of Jai. Uh, and what he said, I, I'm not quite sure if he himself personally saw this or he got eyewitness accounts uh, soon after, but there were 70 or 80 people captured by the KMT in Budai, and they were, uh, which actually does mean a uh, bag, a cloth bag. Now, these people were stuffed into um, 
burlap bags and uh, kicked and perhaps bayoneted and left out in the sun all day. Uh, and what he says is that most of them had suffocated, had died somehow by the time they'd been out there for seven or eight hours, but then their bodies were taken out by boat and thrown in the ocean. Uh, so that's, uh, I believe he mentioned that today in, in Taiwanese in his uh, tape. And he was himself arrested just uh, briefly also after uh, 2 to 8 when the uh, soldiers were just picking up everybody in the countryside. But uh, they didn't, uh, he said that the KMT soldiers were illiterate, so they didn't even get the name straight and they released him uh, or whatever. They didn't have his name straight, that he was one of those actually uh, uh, in, the, in the battle at the, uh, at the airport. Well, uh, something else happened uh, soon after, uh, not too long after, is that from the battle at the airport, uh, Li Rongzong had met a number of people, among them a, a man by the name of Hong, uh, San Dian Sui Hong, Hong, so I can't remember the full name, but it's Hong Wu, I think uh, five, Hong five something. And it's all, it, his full name's on the tape. And this, uh, he was quite an intellectual who had been in China and uh, knew the situation there of the Guomindang and was really dead set against the Guomindang. And he, uh, and altogether about 10 of them, uh, they were basically students. <clears throat> I think they'd been at the uh, normal college. Uh, they, they got together and had just a loose organization, a few meetings, but they mimeographed and put up uh, several, uh, about 250 posters uh, damning the uh, KMT for corruption and uh, lack of self, lack of uh, local self-government and demanding local self-government is actually is in protected in the Constitution. Okay, well for this they were uh, uh, the the police considered that this was an effort at sedition. Uh, they scattered and were not arrested, but this uh, Mr. Hong. Uh, this guy had uh, tremendous uh, chutzpah, I guess that's the word, tremendous chutzpah, and actually went to work uh, for the security agencies in Taipei. And uh, he, uh, he spoke several languages. He had been in the military under the Japanese in New Guinea, and uh, in New Guinea or Indonesia, and had gotten a rather distinctive... Uh, rifle shot across his forehead, a wound, a long uh, wound across his forehead. And unfortunately, this allowed him to be recognized in 1953. And then he was taken in and tortured severely. So before 1953, Li Rongzong and the other people who had been in this group had thought that the ringleader had left for China, had escaped for China in 1949. And so they thought, well, there's no big deal. Nothing's going to happen here. Uh, but then after uh, Hong was arrested, he uh, was, of course, tortured, forced to give names. And uh, as the list unraveled, then Li Rongzong and a lot of other people were taken in. And uh, Li Rongzong, of course, describes those terrible days of the, of the White Terror. Uh, for one, uh, of course, they were, they were tortured. Uh, he was sentenced, I believe it was, to 15 years for being part of a uh, revolutionary group. And uh, particularly the first four years... Come here, come here, baby, come on, come. Uh, what happened to Li Rongzong when he was arrested? Now, he covered all this, I think, in his uh, Taiwanese um, uh, narrative there, but I couldn't pick up all the pieces. And if you had somebody translate in detail, he would, but I talked to him many times. Uh, he um, was sentenced to 15 years, and uh, it probably took a while before he was sentenced, but usually takes about eight or nine months in interrogation and torture and all that. And uh, he was sent to Ankang, and Ankang is the military prison uh, in the hills, uh, kind of to the, to the west of Xingdian. You know, Xingdian is the town on the south side of Taipei County. And he said the conditions there were uh, extremely difficult. And he, he discussed this today also, as he usually does, that uh, they had um, 37 people in one cell. 
and that was the equivalent of uh, six or seven people per ping. Uh, I forget what the total area of the, of the cell was, he said, but it was uh, six to seven people per ping, and a ping is about four square yards, okay, if you get that idea. So they had to, they, there was only enough space for one third of them to lie down at a time. So they had a three rotation system where one third of the people slept for, I think it was like a four hour rotation, and the other two thirds uh, stood. Uh, and of course, an extremely difficult uh, environment. The other is that they hardly gave them any water. Now, An Kong is on a hill area. There should be plenty of water, plus especially in Taipei Basin. Uh, but they only gave them uh, 600 uh, cc's of water a day for, uh, you know, for drinking, for washing, for washing clothes, for everything. So with that many people in that kind of a crowded environment, uh, you can imagine it was not at all healthy, uh, you know, human stench and all that. And they cleaned the toilets as well as they possibly could. They had to drink water out of the toilets uh, part of the time as well as wash in the toilets. I think they had two toilets for uh, two, two, holes, two holes in one section of the, of the room uh, for um, uh, 37 people. And uh, also what was really scary is they, he said, they intentionally put people with active tuberculosis into the, uh, into the cells. And of course, with that many people in close quarters, the tuberculosis spread uh, very rapidly. And he said that in his, uh, I think, five years at An Kong, uh, about uh, half of the people in the cell, of course, there was some rotation through, some were, uh, some were even executed during the time he was there. Um, uh, but uh, people who were taken out because they were ill and never came back, which means they died, uh, were about half of the number of the people in the cell. So he said he probably would have also died in those conditions too, except that uh, he was sent to Green Island. And he says, well, that, that saved him. And there was a new prison built in Green Island in uh, 1971, after, 71 or 72, after the attempted prison break there in 1970. So, uh, relatively speaking, he liked uh, Green Island. Uh, he was released in, uh, let me think, he was sent to Green Island, but there must have been the old prison then, because he got out in 1968. So he was there before the new prison was built, yeah. Um, he got out in 1968, that's 15 years, from 53 to 68, uh, and he went back to his home in Jai. Uh, but even before he got there, uh, you know, he was, they were told when they get out of jail, you must immediately go home and report to the police there. And uh, they were already waiting for him before he got there. Uh, he was so much dogged, of course, they never let anyone who has a political record ever get any decent employment or any kind of schooling again. And he was so harassed that he realized this was a big problem for his family also, his, his father and the rest of his brothers and sisters in Jai. So he uh, left Jai and uh, managed to come to you know Taipei Shinkan. He figured it was near the big city, a little more anonymous, but he settled with a woman in Shinkan, which is where we uh, interviewed him uh, in the temple near there. And his, uh, his own shop that they ran belonged to his wife, who was already 40-some when he married her and had her own children, um, uh, is a, well, like a little uh, medicine shop, uh, what do you call it, you're just selling toothpaste and, and aspirin and, and stuff like that. So he lived through this long history. Um, that was uh, pretty much on the first tape, was all the way to 10 years after he got out of prison, when uh, the 10 or 15 years after he got out of prison when the police were still visiting him every week. And finally he had a kind of a, had it out with them and said, well, look, I've already been out of prison for 10, 15 years and haven't caused any trouble, so, you know, let, let up. And they made him sign, they told him he had to sign a statement and he sat there for a long time and wouldn't sign, wouldn't, they told him he had to write a statement of his, uh, you know, what he had learned from being in prison. and. Uh, he couldn't write anything and couldn't write anything and finally said, okay, well, I'll tell you what I'll write, okay? Uh, viva Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, viva Zhang Jing, uh, Zhang Jie Shi Wan Sui. 
uh, 三民主义, 三万岁, and then something else, uh, 万岁, and then, okay, is that good enough? And they finally let up, let, let up on him. Um, well, in the 1980s, I don't think he said this in tape, but in the 1980s when uh, Taiwan did finally form a political prisoners association, he joined the political prisoners association, I think about 1984, and he was 84, 85 when they had a lot of political prisoners who had been in the Kaohsiung incident uh, released from jail. And uh, there was an, an important vote when the Political Prisoners Association voted to uh, work for the establishment of an independent Republic of Taiwan. And the uh, two political prisoners, former political prisoners, people I know, uh, Xu Cao De and uh, Tsai Yu Chen, who, uh, who brought that motion and it passed, and Li Rongzong was among those who voted for it. Anyway, they, the two of them, uh, uh, Tsai Yu Chen, what? Okay, so I don't think that was incident was on the uh, on his recording. Wait, but what I was your last sentence before I? Okay. Yeah. I well, know. I was talking about uh, Tsai Yuchen and uh, uh, Xu Taoda uh, being sentenced to I think it was eleven years in jail mm -hmm. uh, for passing uh, for uh, bringing up the motion in the political association, the political prisoners association. Uh, to work for the independence of Taiwan. And I think that, I forget how much they were sentenced to, it was something like 11 years, but the uh, Tsai Yuchen, I think, was in for f uh, seven years. Pretty sure he served uh, seven years of that. So I, I think his total years in jail was 11, so I may not be totally correct on that. But his wife is in the uh, legislature now. Uh, well, through those dark days, uh, then that was a, that was uh, about the end of the first half an hour tape of Li Rongzong was his talking about his uh, uh, verbal battle with the police, asking them to stop harassing him and visiting him every week. That was the end of that tape, and then we started a new tape and asked him to uh, fill in some of his early years and also talk about the general issues of why did 228 uh, break out and um, uh, why, what did Taiwanese feel about the Kuomintang and about mainlanders at that time. So he went in into more detail there, first about his own background, uh, that his uh, father uh, was a teacher, was I think a primary uh, teacher under the Japanese, so he spoke Japanese quite well, was educated. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometime in their, in the 40s, uh, their family actually took a Japanese surname change, and he, he gave us his Japanese name also. And as he said, uh, I believe he was born in 1925, so uh, right at the end of World War II, well, 1943, he was 17 years old, and uh, he and most other students who were inculcated into love for the emperor, uh, and by that time had already been, uh, you know, second generation brought up as uh, part of the Japanese Empire, uh, uh, believe well they were pressured or they believed that yes they should join the uh, military effort. So he was some part of uh, like a student's reserve corps, I think, but did receive some military training uh, before 1945. And he's, he's quite articulate the way he describes it that, uh, uh, well, you know, two generations, any people can be persuaded uh, to some large degree that they are part of some citizenship or part of some, uh, some uh, national grouping. And the Taiwanese, just the same, had been inculcated into uh, speaking Japanese and uh, saying they are part of the subjects of the uh, emperor of, of Japan. So he's, uh, I think, you know, his description of nationalism and national consciousness is quite good in that. But at the uh, uh, a rather crucial element, uh, if I remember the more of it, is that there was a um, a local leader in Jai. I think also was the name of uh, Xu Xu maybe the same person he talked about at the Jai incident, who had, um, 
who had been in China, had seen the Chinese military and the Japanese military, and uh, knew that uh, the Chinese military was really no match for the Japanese, and also knew the corruption of the KMT. Um, and I think this formed part of their consciousness, uh, that they knew that China was still a very backward country, and uh, they really didn't want to be uh, joined with uh, China uh, in general. But they didn't have much, you know, they didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. Um, but of course, like all Taiwanese, they saw these uh, ill-disciplined, uh, ill-disciplined, uh, poorly geared, poorly dressed, and uh, rapacious soldiers, uh, Chinese soldiers, the KMT soldiers that came, and they were used to soldiers, uh, Japanese soldiers, being, uh, you know, dignified, well-disciplined. Uh, uh, you know, really having some national pride. And so it was really a shock to Taiwanese to see this uh, KMT military. And you hear from other sources, which uh, I can't remember if it was stories that Li Rongzong told me, or probably was Li Rongzong among others, that there were a lot of incidents of, of uh, the Chinese uh, military, this is before 1947, raping and even killing women and uh, receiving absolutely no punishment for this, uh, not even uh, hardly any semblance of any law and order, um, you know, much less stealing. And, and all of this built up a, you know, the great resentment against uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, occupiers, uh, the Guomindang occupiers, until uh, 228 broke out. And of course that was a period of great economic dislocation. So you'll read this uh, in other sources, like uh, uh, George Kerr's uh, Formosa Betrayed, which I think is extremely detailed, and it was his on-the-spot uh, witness. Well, so then, uh, as I remember in that dialogue, Li Rongzong goes on to describe that sense of uh, Taiwanese feeling, well, what are we doing with the, uh, with the Guomindang, and why should we be part of this uh, so-called China that was in 19, uh, 1947. Um, but he really ended it up talking about the present situation and the present consciousness of uh, people in Taiwan uh, when finally uh, they have uh, achieved some democracy. And he talked about uh, joining the, the DPP and he served in some local office in the DPP um, about 10 years ago, I think in the late, in the late 80s. So I think that, that pretty much finishes up what he said uh, and it was, uh, uh, we filmed him in uh, a temple right on downtown, right on the main old street. It was the old downtown of um, Shenkun, which is right on the river, on the Jingmei River. And a uh, hundred years ago, or uh, less than a hundred years ago, little boats could still come up there and uh, trade down to uh, Wanhua. So it was originally kind of a transportation node on the river. Um, and his shop is one of those uh, shops that's back is right on the river.